Assalamu alaikum and good evening. Welcome to Vision 2030. My name is Anam Chowdhury and I'm the host of this show. This is show is a new initiative. It's, an in it's a community development initiative by uh, the Channel S and the Bangladeshi Regeneration Council. We're working together uh, in the sustainable development and regeneration of the Bangladeshi community here in UK. The Bangladeshi community, uh, as we all know, has grown uh, significantly uh, and rapidly over the last 60 years, from 6,000 to over half a million uh, population in this country. Over a quarter of a uh, quarter of a million of Bangladeshi population currently resides in London, and West Midlands is currently home to uh, second largest Bangladeshi population in the country. Our community has, uh, as we all know, our community has many strengths. We are a united community. We are young. We are very community orientated. We support our families here at home as also uh, abroad. But most importantly, our community is very entrepreneurial. We are very business minded community, so much so that our community is the pioneer of the curry industry here in UK. Our, uh, despite the, however, despite the strength uh, of our community, we also have many challenges. Uh, it is our community currently experiences high level of deprivation, especially in areas of skills, employment, housing and services. Uh, for example, 28% uh, of uh, our Bangladeshi community uh, live in 10% of the most deprived neighbourhood in the country. 28, uh, 60%, 65% of our families are living in low income families. Bangladeshi women, for example, have the, the, the lowest level of participation in the labour market, so much so that 58% of Bangladeshi women are not active in the labour market or not working uh, uh, currently. Uh, our community generally also has the lowest level of uh, language proficiency compared to any other ethnic minority groups in the country. Therefore, if you look at the statistics, the government re governmental reports all indicates that the Bangladeshi community is one of the most disadvantaged and deprived communities in the country. And that is not really acceptable. That is not acceptable to the community in general, but also specifically it's not acceptable for the, to the third generation of Bangladeshis who are living in this great nation uh, that, we are, uh, uh, that we have. England, the United Kingdom, is the second largest economy in the world, and it is Again, not unacceptable for our community, for the Bangladeshi community, to be very disadvantaged living in this country. And that is why, and that is why the Channel S, in partnership with the Bangladeshi Regeneration Council, have got together to introduce this program so that we can talk to you, the community uh, at large, and we want to uh, engage with our community so that we can jointly work together to identify the issues that we have within our communities. But most importantly, we want to be able to work with our community to find the solutions to the problems that we have locally as well as nationally, so that we should no longer be one of, regarded as one of the most disadvantaged and deprived communities in the country. And that is the vision, and that is the vision of 2030 that we are working on. So thank you very much for joining us today, and I would like to uh, welcome our uh, special guest here today. Uh, we have three special guests. We have uh, Councillor Saida Khatoun. Um, she is the Deputy Leader of Sandwell Council. She is also the Chair of the Bangladeshi Regeneration Council, and uh, she's also the founder and the CEO of Bangladeshi Women's Association, which is based in Sandwell in the West Midlands. Welcome to you, Councillor Khatoun. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you. We also have uh, Dr. Uh, Shakawat Hussein. He is a faculty uh, member at Birmingham City uh, University. And Dr. Hussein holds a PhD in material and, man and uh, manufacturing engineering, and uh, he has many in, uh, inventions uh, um, to his uh, uh, credits. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Hussein also specializes in provision of competence-based uh, education and training in England. Welcome to you, Dr. Hussein. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having us. We also have uh, Chris, uh, Reverend uh, Chris Allen. He is a founder of Compass Community Partnership, uh, and he, Chris, is currently leading on a national uh, report, uh, doing some research and development of a national report on the need for a national regeneration program for the Bangladeshi community on behalf of the Bangladeshi Regeneration Council. Thank you very much, Chris, for taking the time to come here today and joining us. Good to be with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I would like to remind. 
our, I would like to remind our viewers uh, that uh, you can also take part, and we would like you to take part in our discussion today. Uh, like I said earlier, we want you to be a part of this uh, discussion and this part of this Vision 2030. You will see the number on your screen, so please do call us uh, when you uh, get the opportunity and take part uh, in the discussion. So moving on to some of the discussions that we, we want to talk about, uh, let's, let's take the, uh, the historical um, uh, demography of the Bangladeshi community uh, actually and I've, I've mentioned earlier that we have the Bangladeshi community has grown significantly from 6,000 to over half a million uh, uh, in the past 60 years but it hasn't been without its challenges has it um, so Councillor Khatun I just want to ask you that you have spent over the last 30 years you have 30 years experience of working with the Bangladeshi community uh, working to build uh, their capacity and so forth and could you therefore share with us some of your knowledge about uh, uh, the initial migration and also some of the challenges our community has gone through over the past 60 years, especially at the beginning of the journey that we uh, began here in UK. Okay, I mean obviously I'm one of the second generation of um, sort of people who migrated to England. Um, the first generation I speak to many people, many of the elders that came here in the late 50s and early 60s, they came for work, mm -hmm. you know, for the work opportunities that was here in the foundries and they tell us about a lot of the issues that they, they faced when they came here. Mm -hmm. So the first, you know, not having a language at all, mm -hmm. language barriers, and the people that I sort of come across were the ones that had no, you know, they couldn't read and write in Bengali either, so there was no uh, lack of education there. Um, and then, uh, you know, coming in straight into the foundry work, there was a lot of issues around health and safety, about the employment, you know, aspect of living, so they had a low paid you know the laboring jobs that they went into um the the other challenges was you know they were in overcrowded housing there were so many people you know some people shared stories about sharing their beds you know so the day workers would come and uh, sleep in the beds at the night and the mm -hmm. night shift workers would leave the same beds mm -hmm. so they could go so there was fa uh, people sharing those there was issues around there there, there weren't mosques and that around so they couldn't uh, practice the religion they used to meet in houses um, and um, in terms of times you know not knowing when was Ramadan what time to start fasting what time to break the fast all those um, you know but they all were those very hard those working people they were hard working very they hard worked working uh, some of them worked seven days a week mm -hmm. uh, or seven nights a week if they did night shift okay. and they left you know families behind as well mm -hmm. um, the, the, and then there was the next next sort of migration was families you know mm -hmm. bringing spouses and children and that brought with them again overcrowded housing mm -hmm. and people living low you know three four families in one house you know sharing one bedroom mm -hmm. per family you know bathrooms and that kind of stuff and in terms of the language barriers were still there mm -hmm. women didn't go out at all they were mm -hmm. isolated they mm -hmm. were lonely they you know the, basically they they suffered a lot of depression because the fact that the men went to work and they were locked in the houses all day, mm -hmm. they, they found it, you know, there, there was no way that they could socialize or have any social activities. Right. Even the men had no social activities because they were working seven days a week. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a lot of difficulties. And a lot so there was a lot of isolation also from the mainstream, mainstream yeah. society. Yeah. And, and But there were, the bottom line is they were very hard working people and uh, they were committed to their families, yes. uh, earning the money and obviously sending it back and wherever there was possible they were bringing their families here uh, mm -hmm. to support them. Dr. Hussein, I want to ask you, um, obviously migration has many purposes and looking back, uh, has it purely been economic migration for the Bangladeshi community here in UK or was there other factors uh, that were in play? I do not think any migration is not economical. Okay. The migration that has taken place in the UK or mm -hmm. in Europe, America, they were basically focused based on economics. Mm -hmm. As a, For example, uh, Saudi Arabia, in the Middle East, people can go there, but you earn money, send it, and you are out after mm -hmm. the visa is over. You stay there for six months or six years or 60 years, your job contract finishes, you have to go back. But in the UK, we had the chance, opportunity to extend our stay, okay. have, make a country a home of yourself. So it was economy. Okay. For example, what Councillor said is um, a lot of people came who are uh, uneducated, purely came uh, just like that, they happened to be here. Mm -hmm. But there are some people like a uh, small portion, uh, doctors, some people who came here for doing PhDs and higher education sponsored mm -hmm. uh, by their government, mm -hmm. they also came here and stayed, they okay. didn't go back. 
Okay. So that was also economic. Okay. Although they came here for studies, mm -hmm. but at the back of this, there was something, some hidden so agenda. So the purpose changed. Purpose, purpose changed. changed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and many of them, or most of them, did go back, mm -hmm. but uh, many of them stayed. And okay. I came uh, as a visitor, for example, uh, at the end of Bangladesh War, 72. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We didn't know where we fit in, mm -hmm. and uh, we are going to stay or not stay here or there. But gradually, you know, it, it was stayed. from there. But, uh, for example, our predecessors who came here, they did very good, good job, mm -hmm. splendid job. Mm -hmm. The mosque and education centers, mm -hmm. for example, our children can go and study in the mosque. Mm -hmm. Those were started right um, okay. a bit earlier. Okay. Like the Pakistani community, they started in the 40s, probably 50s, mm -hmm. uh, which went on. So anyway, we should be grateful to our predecessors. Indeed. Indeed. So they have really built the foundation, foundation. on which we are currently, yeah. uh, you know, using. And 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 without them, we would be definitely it would be in a difficult situation. Impossible. Now. Yes. Okay. Impossible. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hussein, for that insight. Chris, um, you have I've known you for quite a long time, and you have spent uh, a um, a significant number of your career so far in working uh, within deprived communities and neighbourhood across the country. You work for the government as an advisor for deprived uh, neighbourhood and, and communities. I mean, tell us about your experience and understanding of the Bangladeshi community and, uh, and the role that the community has played um, in the success of making Britain a multicultural um, economic power in the world. And how much contribution have we made? Uh, massive amount, massive amount. And I think one of the... Um one of the reasons why I've lived in around Birmingham the last thirty odd years is I love the I love the culture mm -hmm. that is around uh, in in society. It brings something to mm -hmm. to Great Britain and people outside. I think and some of the the white population wouldn't see things in those terms, but in, not in my terms, I mm -hmm. see it as being an enriching culture. And from a Bangladeshi point of view, mm -hmm. having I love the food, so you know, I'm. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably bad for me to eat too much of it, but it, you know, I love it, and um, therefore, from a personal level, it's enriching in that way. But as I think about the different communities I've worked in over the years, even communities where there would be a Bangladeshi population as part of it. Mm -hmm. There's been an absence, really, of Bangladeshi people being around the table when decisions are being made around different community initiatives. Mm -hmm. I think engaging the community is very, very difficult anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but unless there's something quite targeted and quite specific, mm -hmm. I don't believe the Bangladeshi community is uh, appropriately engaged. Mm -hmm. I think of a couple of examples where it, it has worked well. I remember back in um, about 20 years ago when I was working in the city of Birmingham mm -hmm. in the Aston Newtown area there, the Bangladeshi Youth Forum, very powerful and we worked alongside them and they specifically you know, sought to engage young people from Bangladesh background. Um, and at the moment over in Tipton, you know, thanks to Councillor Katoon's work there, something quite specific, but it does have to be specific. It can't, if, if, if you don't target this particular community, like many communities really, then they don't have the opportunity to be engaged. And I think what you said before about this isolation that was there and, and may have continued over the years, it is still there. Uh, and that, is, that leads to, I think, some of the data and statistics that you were, you were mentioning there. So I see the Bangladesh community as, you know, people are really enriched Mm -hmm. where I live, where I am, um, but I don't see them around the table often enough in making decisions mm -hmm. about what happens where they live. Okay. One thing I uh, yeah? feel Dr. bad Sam? about. You don't have Bangladeshi food, do you? It's well, all called Indian food. Well, I know, wh I know where it comes from. <laughs> <laughs> I know what it's labelled, I know where it comes from, uh, but absolutely. I heard our people, uh, elder people said, you know, when we came here, it was India. Mm -hmm. It changed to Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So we said, okay, still keep it Indian because uh, people will say Pakistani. And then it became Bangladesh. The so independence. Uh, yeah. So it, we didn't we didn't want to change from India to Pakistan to Bangladesh. So they still continue calling it India. But there's a real but there's a real pride within the Bangladesh community about mm -hmm. curry and um, and uh, two I think two out of five um, Bangladeshi men work in in the catering industry still mm -hmm. in this country. Mm -hmm. um, but when I talk to some of the folks who were at the Bangla Mala earlier in the or uh, well, last year now <laughs> last year last summer, then some of them had other jobs, but they kept the family tradition mm -hmm. of the restaurant going as well. So it wasn't that they were just doing the restaurant because it was the only thing to do. They actually thought, no, this is a part of our tradition, it's part of our culture mm -hmm. in this country, and therefore it's a little bit of both really in terms of um, yes it is a particular um, skill and gift that is brought along but also there's a tradition of the family that, that the Bangladesh community is seeking to continue. They yeah, cool. still want to go away from that. Yes, yeah. well, well both, both end. Yes, that's right, and greater ambition than that because mm -hmm. you know the Bangladesh community are 
uh, work in fairly low skill, low paid jobs. Yeah. 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 And, and I think and lately it's a bit at the moment a, the taxi industry is yes, also exa absolutely. come late as well. I see a lot of people in my undergraduate studies, Bangladeshis, are coming into education, engineering, mm -hmm. which I didn't see in the past. So it's a good sign that they're studying law, engineering, and others. And I think one of, the, one of the important uh, things that we have uh, uh, now is that many of our elderly generation are really encouraging the younger generation yes. to go into education. And therefore, we see a, a transition in the success uh, in the education sector. Mm -hmm. You know, we, I talked about issues within the employment and, and uh, skills and so forth. But one of the areas that we are moving forward is within the education sector. And that's because our elderly, our parents, you know, mm -hmm. people of the first generation, are making a strong point that without education, our community would be hard to, uh, uh, you know, uh, hard to develop. So, you know, we are quite grateful that we have that um, progression, at least within the yeah. education uh, uh, sector that we have. There's a lot more work to do, and, uh, and, I'm, sh uh, and I'm sure we will be uh, talking about some of those, uh, um, some of the, you know, some of the core issues. And I think after the break, we'll be talking about the the case report, and which is something that you've um, uh, looked into, Chris. So. Um, Again, I want to ask the callers uh, if you have, uh, if you want to join us, uh, you can certainly um, call in uh, on the number that you can see on your screen, and you can take part in the discussion that we are taking, uh, we are holding today. So, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, before you go for a short break, uh, Councillor Khatoun, I mean, um, do you uh, do you have? Uh, um, I mean, you work in a community centre mm -hmm. uh, in Sandwell. Do you have many of our uh, elderly generation coming to uh, the centre and asking for services? I mean, do you see an influx of of, of the elderly generation? Do you have yeah. many clients? I mean, the older older generation come along, and they mostly they they just want their sort of benefits, mm -hmm. welfare benefits sorted, mm -hmm. so they want to maximise their income, the housing benefit, council taxes. Mm -hmm. Sorted, and now I mean there is a you know they've got the long-term illnesses, so you know you've got your arthritis and that. Mm. People who've worked in the industry who've, mm. who've suffered, have, you know the chronic illnesses that they've got, the heart disease and that. So they've got the health problems, um, but we do have a younger generation that come in as well, and they're, they're more interested in employment, education, mm -hmm. you know, and training. So we, we're looking at you know ways of making sure that they sort of get the maximum okay. sort of opportunity. Okay. to to go into the future you know the future sort of progression routes okay. really well, thank you very much. Well. Thank you very much, Councillor Khatun. We have to go for a short break now, but we will be back. Uh, please join us again, and we will be talking about the Casey report that the government has recently released, and uh, uh, and we will be looking into the, some of the core statistics about our community. So we will be back. Thank you. Join us again. <laughs> 